Hello, welcome to the Friday, July 28th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Washington, D.C. When you are connecting to a website these days, you hardly ever directly connect to the web server. Instead, your request is typically forwarded by one or more proxies. Now, there are different types of proxies. Some of them are really more in front of the client and are often used to cache content, sometimes also to accelerate requests. And then we have proxies in front of servers, sometimes referred to as reverse proxies, that are used for load balancing and of course filtering like web application firewalls. An interesting blog by James Kettle of Portsficker takes a look at how these particular middle stations can be used to manipulate requests, in particular to forward requests to unintended destinations. Now typically when your browser sends a request it will look up an IP address for a host name and then send the request to that IP address and use a host header that matches the host name that you're trying to reach. What happens quite often with these proxies, in particular if they're part of a content delivery network or CDN, is that many, many different websites do share one IP address and the host name can be used to resolve this ambiguity. Now, the problem shows up then if you send a crafted request using an artificial host name that does not necessarily match the host name that a browser would insert. For example, you could add a port number to that host name that's different than port 80 or port 443, in which case the request could, for example, be routed to an admin interface that often listens on a different port. Also, I can then redirect requests to totally different destinations. Overall, these issues aren't really that new. They have always existed, in particular with these reverse proxies. But uh, as this blog shows, there are many, many ways to exploit uh, these issues. And James does a real great job in his blog post to look at uh, some of the different architectures that you in particular see more and more over the last few years, like these content delivery networks, but also proxies implemented by ISPs. And earlier in July, the master key for older Pedia crypto ransomware versions was released. And with that, of course, it was possible for victims to decrypt their files. Now, at that point, it still wasn't really all that easy to apply this master key, in particular, since there are a number of different versions of this malware that work slightly differently different from each other. Malwarebytes now released a simpler decryptor that takes advantage of this master key. It works for Red Petya, Green Petya, Misha and GoldenEye, including the systems that had a boot locker applied that doesn't necessarily allow you to easily boot the system. This particular infected GoldenEye. Now, most importantly, this will not work for the not Petya version, which of course probably caused the most damage. And if you're using Suricata as an IDS, a major new version was just released, Suricata 4.0. One nice new feature that stood out to me was the support for Start TLS. Start TLS, of course, often used with email, but can also be used with LDAP and a couple of other services in order to negotiate TLS on the fly when you don't want to connect to a different port in order to switch to TLS. Also, the EVE logging format did receive some extensions. EVE does log events in JSON, which of course makes it easy to import it into a variety of new NoSQL databases. So overall, by upgrading, you'll get new features, you'll get better performance, nothing you have to rush, no security issues or so that are being addressed in this update. And in Diaries today, we have one by Xavier talking about how to set up a very limited, simple honeypot just using Netcat. 
So it's Friday again and uh, today I have with me another STI student, uh, Sean McCulloch, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the research uh, he's uh, doing in particular with uh, using DevOps tools in security. Uh, Sean, why don't, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Sean McCullough. Uh, I work for the federal government. Um, I'm, I'm actually technically a software developer, but over the last six years I've been looking at and focusing more on information security. Uh, I just walked for my STI graduation just a couple days ago, and I'm actually just finishing up my last class. So I'm, I'm at the end of the, of the program, which is very exciting. So they actually already let you walk. They did let me have... walk, yes. So I wouldn't have to wait a whole year, yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. That's nice of them. Now, um, with these DevOps tools, you wrote uh, really two different papers, right. uh, one using Vagrant, the other right. one using Docker. And you explain to me a little bit uh, what sort of made you use these tools or what's the background of these papers? Yeah, I, I, I started getting interested in figuring out how um, if a researcher has, is writing a paper or there's a SANS blog post, um, is there something they can do to package up their research environment so that anybody could install it and run it in their own environment without any money and uh, be able to replicate whatever it is the researcher was trying to, to do? And I, I really was interested in this uh, for, for really two reasons. Um, as a software developer, I was uh, working with Vagrant and Docker in my own uh, projects, and so I was learning how they were used and learning how to use these DevOps tools. But also because as I was studying for the GSE, there was a couple instances where I wanted to go and try and test out a technique and it would be late at night and I really just wanted to just try it out really quick and I would do the research in the project or whatever the, re uh, the paper was and it would be a lot of steps in order to, in to install it. So that's kind of got me thinking, is there an easier way for these researchers to replicate this so that any Joe that just wants to download it can run it in just a couple commands? So can you describe a sample architecture kind of that you use this for? Yeah, um, so in the Vagrant paper, uh, I tried a couple different things and uh, some of them worked and some of them didn't. But um, the idea was uh, a, a couple, in a couple different situations, if I want to be able to test maybe an exploitation. So I would need a uh, be able to easily stand up a server that's got some kind of vulnerability and then I need to run the exploit. So standing up that server with the vulnerability may be easy because it could be something meta, like metasploitable that's out there, but in a lot of cases it's not that easy. There's a lot of installation. So uh, there was that. For the Docker paper, I was really interested in multi-hop uh, techniques. So if I've got to do a pivot through some gateway uh, and how I would replicate that, whether it was through an SSH uh, tunnel or even using Metasploit's capability. So I tried to uh, start off with an easy scenario with Vagrant in my first paper and then an easy scenario with Docker in the second paper and then try and build on them and make them more complex until I couldn't get them to work any longer. So uh, with the Docker, with the second one, yeah. there were obviously multiple machines involved. Yes. If I would like to replicate like one of these experiments uh, that you did there, what do I actually download? Do I have to download virtual machines or? Uh, that's a great question. For Docker, you would have to download, well, you, you should download Git because um, if you want to replicate what I did, I wrote all the code and all the scripts and I put it on my Docker, on my uh, GitHub page. So you would just download Git and, and then run the command to clone my project. And then you'd have to install Docker. And that's basically it. Um, the, the tests that I did for this paper were really looking at uh, if you're running Docker on a Mac or a Linux uh, host. So that could be a virtual machine or it could just be your, your host computer. Um, but I needed the networking that comes with Linux in order for it to work exactly right. Uh, but that's all you'd have to need. Now for the, for the Vagrant paper, it was very similar. You would need to run Vagrant and then um, you would also need to download a, a virtual box in order to run the virtual machines, which is what Vagrant is kind of based off of. So uh, really all you have to do is download the GitHub repository mm -hmm. and uh, then run the script in order to set it all up. That, that's the idea. Um, uh, for Docker, I, I actually did a much better job of, of making it easy to use. And uh, Docker is really designed to stand up uh, a system to run your apps and to do it the same no matter whether you're using on a local system or if you're running on AWS or whatever it is. If it, if it runs Docker, you should be able to run the same command. So um, for the multi-system uh, environment that I set up, there's a, there's a, pro, um, a Docker uh, tool called Docker Compose which allows you to orchestrate a number of different systems. So everything was captured in the Docker uh, Compose file and so just one command will install everything that's needed for all four of the systems for my setup. 
Now your first paper was Vagrant, your second mm -hmm. paper was Docker. Was it just because you learned about Docker later or are there certain use case for Vagrant or yeah. Docker is better? Uh, actually, uh, uh, my history of using Vagrant and Docker, I kind of have gone back and forth. The, the tool sets are, are getting better and better every year. And so I found that uh, when I first learned about Vagrant and Docker, I started using Docker. I had limitations uh, with trying to set up multiple systems. Uh, so then I switched over to Vagrant. I found limitations in networking. So if, if um, and, the, and it's mostly the way, uh, well, I guess I should back up and say, my for my papers, I was trying to figure out how to make it really easy and completely free for somebody to download and install the system. So if you needed a big rig or if you needed uh, to purchase software, I kind of left that out and said, this is not what really what I want to focus on. So in Vagrant, I found that um, if I want to run a Windows virtual machine or if I want to run a Linux virtual machine, Vagrant did a good job of um, downloading all the scripts and uh, setting up and provisioning the virtual machine, which, which what Vagrant does. Vagrant is basically provisioning virtual machines uh, through VM uh, uh, VirtualBox. If you wanted to do it in VMware and get some of the really nice networking comes with it, you had to pay. There was a license fee. So um, I, I, in my research paper, I kind of didn't use the VMware version. I just used the VirtualBox. And I found that it worked really well for some things. Uh, for in instance, I could run a Linux machine and a Windows machine, and I could use Vagrant to uh, provision both of those with, with pretty good ease. Uh, but if I wanted to have some kind of uh, really cool networking between them or subnetworks, I was having a lot of trouble replicating that with uh, uh, the uh, Vagrant system. So really to make Docker work well, you want to have the commercial VMware workstation? For, to make Vagrant to work well, yes. Sorry, I, sorry, if, you, if you're a professional uh, pen tester or you're, you want to really do these in a real lab, it's only $100. So it's not like it's a lot of money. But um, you would need the connectors so that Vagrant knows how to communicate with uh, with uh, VMware, yeah. So you, it, you, I think it's a hundred, hundred and ten dollars, yeah. but that's all. Not high, but still, you know, it's still, it's still, still something. Money. Yeah. Still so money. if you want to just try something at on the uh, just you know in the middle of the night, you would have to go and purchase it and, and do a couple other steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah cool. And now uh, all of the URLs for your GitHub repository are in your papers. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And you're still working with this, or what's next? For um, you? Yeah, I, I'm actually interested in taking it a, a little bit step further. Um, I've looked at other uh, pen testing environments or pen testing um, uh, target machines and figuring out uh, it, can you wrap them up in Docker so that you can make it easier. The nice thing about Docker is that uh, Docker has a, a public repository. So with just one command, I can go and pull and download an image that's already been created. So everything's been done and just run it in my local environment. So that's one of the really nice things about uh, that Docker does. So um, I've been looking at um, what does Metasploitable have a, a, a Docker um, instance. Um, I did have problems in my paper getting uh, Metaspl um, Interpreter to run uh, because um, most of the, the OSs out there don't have all the libraries needed for Interpreter to do some really cool stuff. So I'm looking at how to kind of make that a little bit easier for people to download and play. That sounds really cool. So I'll probably check it out at some point. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us here. And that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.